Welcome to the Informed Pregnancy and Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Elliot Berlin, prenatal chiropractor, childbirth educator, and labor doula. I'm joined by today's co-host, Angelica Ortiz. Angelica is an undergraduate degree in neuroscience from University of California, Riverside, and she's currently a student at Southern California University of Health Sciences, expected to graduate in April 2018 as a doctor of chiropractic. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks. I'm excited to be here. What made you want to become a chiropractor? Oh, uh, um, I After I graduated, I had a few internships because I was clueless about what I could do with a neuroscience degree. Well, then let's back up. What made you go for a neuroscience degree? I love the nervous system. Really? The brain. Yeah, it fascinates me. And it was way more fun than bioengineering, which is what I started off with initially. So science from the, like, from the beginning. I mean, I feel like most people going into undergraduate don't know undeclared <laughs> undeclared okay but like very science you like you've always liked science yeah i have it actually started fourth grade when i went to science camp but um oh science camp yeah whoa yeah. okay <laughs> usually sports camp dance camp band camp oh i went to every camp my mom tried to get me out of the house as much as she could oh, really? <laughs> yeah <laughs> it would be science camp then dance camp then <laughs> she has succeeded uh, and then so neuroscience and how did that turn into chiropractic? You love so the basically system, with so. neuroscience, it's all you can do is research or become a professor and neither of those sounded uh, interesting to me. So I just had a ton of internships after graduating and um, the chiropractor that I interned for was the happiest. His patients were extremely happy mm. and he gave, he gave all his patients almost immediate relief. And I just always have agreed with like the lifestyle that chiropractic promotes, just like a holistic approach, letting the body heal itself. Had you been to chiropractors before that yourself? Not before my internship, no. That was the beginning of yeah. it. Yeah. And you, you one crack and you were addicted. Exactly. I hear you. A lot of people <laughs> say that. Uh, and now you, uh, you're you interning with me. Uh, mm -hmm. And and so you've come down in the world, which is okay. <laughs> <laughs> which is I, okay. Wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. But you have like uh, a curiosity about prenatal care and uh, postnatal care and babies. Yeah, definitely. It's fascinating. And the way that you help the women is is really great. I do what I can. You're in, I've worked with a lot of interns. Um, you're impressive. I'm excited for you to graduate oh, and thank uh, you. carry the torch so I can retire and watch Netflix. Um, <laughs> today, our guest is Leah Krieff. She's a mother of three young children under the age of four. And um, a few months back, your husband, Leah Adam, was diagnosed with primary myelofibrosis. Correct. Did I say that right? Yeah. Okay. It's a cancerous disorder in which normal bone marrow tissue is gradually replaced with a fibrous scar-like material. Over time, this leads to progressive bone marrow failure, and it can't be cured unless he has a bone marrow transplant. And my hope is that by the time people hear this, podcast by the time you're listening to this audience adam has found his match and has had a complete recovery thank you um so normally our podcasts are light and fun and informative and i really wanted to have you on the podcast because you're light and fun and informative <laughs> generally speaking um but you know i've known you through all your pregnancies and just you're a special person i've, I've had got to meet adam long before this happened um, you guys are very, very special people, and um, I'm working with you now going th through this process and really learned a lot of information about bone marrow that I didn't know myself, and I wanted to uh, share it with our audience. Um, a lot of times during pregnancy, people are thinking about stem cells, and they're presented with the opportunity to stay, save their cord blood, uh, bank the cord blood or cord tissue. And um, it's hard. We don't really know what that means and what you can do with it and can't do with it. And so the more specific relevance to our audience is, is stem cells through cord blood. But um, bone marrow is kind of fascinating, too. And I think that we're when we get on the topic of thinking about these diseases and how we can be helpful, uh, there's a lot to explore here. So I'd love to go back a little bit and find out uh, how did you find out Adam had this disease? Um, well, uh, for a couple of months, Adam had been losing quite a bit of, of weight. Um, he was having decreased appetite. Uh, he was increasingly lethargic. And it was sort of something like I was um, this this voice in the back of his head being 
you know, you got to get to a doctor, you got to see a specialist. And so what started out with his primary care physician saying something to the effect of, well, you know, I don't really see anything wrong. Your numbers are coming back normal, perhaps. You know, you're just stressed out at work. And there was a lot of that. You must just be stressed. You must just be stressed. But Adam, by nature, is not someone who gets stressed out easily. He's um, very positive. He's quite active. Um, and in, in those months, he was less and less active and um, less and less um, energetic and whatnot. And so uh, we have a very dear friend who also happens to be Adam's cardiologist. He was born with a bicuspid valve which is really no big deal right now, but just has to be monitored. Um, He then said to Adam that he wants him to be seen by an ID specialist, um, an infectious disease specialist, um, a uh, hematologist to have a complete workup. Gosh, who else else didn't we see? Um, Was that after seeing him for a cardiology visit? Yes, he'd been seeing him for quite some time. And then also just, again, through the friendship and and getting to know Adam and seeing this this sort of change in him. Right, you can see it as a friend in a different way than you can see it as a doctor. Very much so. And so for that reason, we we visited everyone under the sun. And um, everyone was coming back with question marks versus answers. And that was Mm. really frustrating Um, until... Um, basically, one day, um, the doctor said, the hematologist said that he had some to, you know, some elevated numbers and that they warranted um, a visit back in six months rather than in a year. Oh, wow. And so, you know, that was disconcerting. But um, we really put it in the back of our minds because, again, cancer was just not on our radar. And when we Nobody went. Nobody mentioned it? No. Wow. Not at all. And if anything, um, the hematologist who even read the results sort of poo-pooed them and said, you know, yes, slightly elevated, but really nothing to worry about. Okay. And um, he even had a bone marrow biopsy um, completed, and, and the results came back, uh, according to the doctor who, you know, gave forth the information as unremarkable. Um, you know, give us six months down the line, and, and the, the results were read very differently by a different uh, hemonc. The original results? Yes. Not a new test. Yes. Um, who said that um, Adam had very high cellularity, meaning that um, although the numbers weren't grossly out of the range of within, you know, within typical limits, the cellularity was high enough that it warranted further Mm -hmm. evaluation. And so um, that cellularity, that presence of, you know, this, this marked density that they were seeing was really this massive overproduction of cells that the body was or that the marrow was producing because of his myelofibrosis. So mm. it was just everything was just packed in and jammed in and he had another bone marrow biopsy which then confirmed uh, a myeloproliferative blood disorder. This is 6 months later. Yes, which still didn't scream out cancer. But his health is I imagine continuing to Yeah, he at, at that point was again increasingly lethargic had probably lost close to between 15 to 18 pounds at the time. Which is very much significant uh, yes. percentage. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, he was also uh, starting to experience increased back pain. Um, He was starting to get achy knees. And this is a guy who snowboards, who plays basketball, who is um, painfully athletic, Mm -hmm. Um, just really takes to any sort of sport really quickly. Um, And so when he said that to us, Adam was really of the mind you know, let's wait till we um, we get more brains on this before we share this with our families and things like that. And that was, again, a hard process. But um, that physician, that hemonc, then sent us over to another who specialized in um, rare, uh, less typically occurring myeloproliferative blood disorders and rarer cancers, blood cancers. And um, we walked in and within about 15 minutes of being there, he said, you've got myelofibrosis. And we were so taken aback because, you know, in that quick Wikipedia moment, um, we found that myelofibrosis is something, uh, uh, what we understood to be at the time, a slow-moving cancer that typically affects, you know, geriatric patients Older at large. People, yeah. And so we sort of scratched our heads about that and said, you know, are, are you sure? And he said, you know, the only, the bone marrow biopsy can, you know, confirm what I believe to be what you have, but it's pretty obvious to me. What was he basing it on? So his symptoms, the achiness, the night sweats. Oh, that was another thing. Um, 
something I want to bring up, if anybody is experiencing night sweats, it is not typical. Oh, yeah. And I'm not talking about, you know, you're perspiring or those mamas who, you know, post uh, having kids are, um, you know, soaking their sheets. That I've been through that. That's OK. But if you are um, a seemingly typical 30 something year old who is sweating through one to two shirts a night, that is something that you want to look into. That is not OK. Mm-hmm. Without explanation. Without explanation. Very yeah. much so. And I'm not talking about hot summer nights. How long was that going on for? Probably, um, I want to say, sporadic over five months. Oh, and even then the doctors didn't... No, it was something that was written down. They, I mean, they tested Adam from everything to, um, you know, all kinds of like flesh-eating bacteria to um, irritable bowel to all sorts of things, to allergies, all kinds of things. You know, is, is it a gluten issue? Um, all kinds of stuff. And um, that wasn't the case. And um, the bone marrow biopsy results um, and also how he was presenting clinically with his bone pain and his achiness and what he believed to be his back pain, um, the, the doctor was very comfortable with the diagnosis. And so he explained to us that this was a slow-moving cancer, um, a slow-moving blood cancer, and that Adam could be put on a series of medication that could help minimize his symptoms but not stop the cancer in its tracks. And definitively, the only cure for for said cancer would be a bone marrow transplant. But that really wouldn't be something, according to him at the time, wouldn't be something that we'd have issue with for years down the line and really not something that we need to have in the forefront of our minds. So we put the notion of transplant in our back pocket because that was a very disconcerting word to hear. Of course. And we moved forward with, um, you know, what we believed to be this chronic, slow-moving cancer. Um, About two weeks later, Adam uh, believed he threw out his back and had excruciating back pain to the point where he could barely move from bed to bathroom, from bed to couch. Um, It was really difficult. And so after a few days, he'd gone into his hemonc. Um, and explain to him his symptoms because he wanted to actually ask his permission to get a cortisone shot, if that was okay, even, you know, given his diagnosis and whatnot to alleviate any of his pain or even an epidural because the pain was excruciating. And you could sort of see that the color ran from the hemonk's face and this look of concern just washed over the entire room. And I even remember that moment um, my father-in-law was in the room, my husband was in the room, and I was in the room as well. And I immediately got up, and I, I feel my voice quivering even as I'm saying it, but I um, I kind of gr- grasped the, the handles of my chair as I stood because I knew what he was about to say was not good news. And so what he said was that he believed that the cancer had sort of transformed and progressed into a slow-moving chronic cancer to something far more aggressive and that perhaps it had actually transformed into leukemia. And so Adam had another bone marrow biopsy right there and then. And he had a very high count um, and was brought in two days later for inpatient chemotherapy. And so we just went from, you know, this happy family of five with a five and a half month old at the time, a two-year-old and a three-year-old to... um, Two very scared people trying to balance uh, cancer and babies and fear. And um, it was very scary and very, very isolating. And, and that really was the start of our, our journey. Wow. Um, I don't want to cut you off at all, but um, Hemonk. Is a hematologist oncologist. Uh, right. Yes. So um, this is a blood cancer specialist. A blood cancer specialist. How does someone get this kind of cancer? Is it a luck of the draw? Is it genetic? So that's probably um, um, a sort of culmination of things. Um, in Adam's case, thalassemia is something that runs in his family, and that's a blood disorder in and of itself. Um, he had a distant relative who had experienced leukemia. Um, but Adam's cancer uh, has much in part to do with, and this is through the sort of um, like the, the the genetics that were then you know picked at and picked apart thereafter. 
but Adam has what's called an ATM gene, and he's actually the only documented, known and documented case in the world who has this one gene. Basically, I'm going to say this. He has something in his body that um, doesn't allow his body to stop production or overproduction of, um, of cells. And so his body is in perpetual, you know, factory mode and just cranking out cells, cranking out it's cells. It's a genetic mutation. Very much so. And um, one that's very um, rare and very specific to Adam's case. Okay. Yeah. I remember a physician say a physician friend saying something to me to the effect of when when asked what does Adam have, he says Adam has Adam's disease. Oh, you know, wow. because it's so rare in nature and, and it's so different in its quality. It's interesting also that you said, I mean, in retrospect, you must look at some of these doctors and want to shake them and be like, Why yes. didn't you find this? Yeah. But as a pr- practitioner, I can tell you sometimes, you know, and you might have seen this in Jill Gun Clinic, I mean, you'll certainly see it in practice. Sometimes someone walks into the office and their body has not read the textbook at all. Right. So my first gall, gallbladder diagnosis, right, gallstones, was, uh, you know, you know the mnemonic for gallbladder? It's not... Not really politically correct, but it's the four F's. It's oh, yeah. Female, fat, fertile, and 40. Beautiful. Yeah. You expect somebody who's a little overweight. I think they had added a, flatulin in there, too. Oh, great. Nice. That's out of the five F's. Nice. Thing. <laughs> so they've had a bunch of, uh, a couple of kids, and they're getting older, um, and they're women. Uh, the first person I ever walked into my office with it was a skinny 19-year-old boy. Um, and I was just like scratching my head on these symptoms. Didn't catch it the first visit, but by the second visit, when it was getting worse, I started thinking back, like, what are all the different things it can be? And I remember even thinking gallbladder. I'm like, nah, it can't be gallbladder. He's not a female or fat or fertile or 40. And his body just didn't read the textbook. So I have to imagine, you know, no matter how much science and technology we have, at some point you, you know, you just don't have what you need to make the diagnosis, to yeah. make the call. They're searching. They want to find it just as much. You know, on, on one hand, they want to find it and fix it and get over it. And on the other hand, they want to believe that there's nothing really wrong. So it's it's tough, but, you know, it's tough from all sides. Yeah. So Adam, if I understand it correctly, he has a blood disorder as part A to begin with that runs in the family. Well, he actually tested negative for thalassemia, oh, so he doesn't, he doesn't have, have that, but that's just something in our water, I guess, now. Okay. But, so he has something totally different. He just can't stop producing cells. Yes. Is it an autoimmune disease? So it's it's the not, onset's really late. Right. The onset is pretty late. And and typically, um, this isn't, again, something that's seen in anyone but the geriatric population. Um, so Adam's case is very strange. Um, it's, it's what's supposed to be a chronic, slow-moving blood disorder. Um, but in Adam's case, it's an aggressive, fast-moving blood cancer. Yeah. So down to leukemia. Well, it actually, um, in the process of Adam's um, journey, it had actually transformed at some point into leukemia, and he had to do two rounds of induction chemotherapy, which involved um, a week-long um, course of chemo treatment, and then three weeks thereafter to stay inpatient so that his numbers could come up and he could be um, isolated during that time because when your numbers are as low as his were, we're talking about, you know, 0.1 white blood cell count um, and super low neutrophils, you have to be isolated because your immune system is just shot. Isolated in the hospital, just removed from everybody else? Um, you can't go into my husband's room without a gown, a mask, gloves on. Um my kids have seen. That's m- when he had no leukocyte, when yeah. his white blood count even, was really Even low. now, because um, he had to, again, he had to do a different, um, a second dose of the induction chemotherapy because he had actually gone home after being inpatient for nine weeks and went home. Um, when his numbers were slowly starting to come up, we had anticipated that, because again, chemotherapy and other cancers can be a cure, but in Adam's case, it is really. Um, a means just to buy time until the transplant takes place. In the chemotherapy, what's it targeting? Um, it's basically trying to um, 
stop these fast-moving cells in their tracks by killing them. Uh, scar tissue growth? So it's not going to kill the scar tissue growth. It's going to kill the cells because that bone pain that he was experiencing, what that actually is, is um, the density, like the volume in his bones. The, the marrow is a very narrow space, and it's so packed with these cells mm-hmm. that it's just they're, they're pushing out and putting pressure on his bones. From the inside. Exactly. And so what the the chemotherapy does is it kills the cells, and then you don't have as as vast uh-huh. of uh, a the, number of cells in the not body. So much yeah, in there. exactly. And he's also but on. But it's just going to come back. Yes, he's also on a chemo pill that's called. Um, there's Jacoffi, Jacoffi, Jacoffi. There's a lot of tomato, tomato there, but is this wonderful drug that really helps him with um, uh, minimizing his night sweats, minimizing his bone pain, and. Um, Another thing that I had forgotten to mention, another telltale myelofibrosis indicator is an enlarged spleen. And Adam complained of um, a lack of appetite. Mm. And what was happening, unbeknownst to any of us, was that his spleen was getting bigger and bigger. um, And it was actually pushing against his stomach such that he was feeling full after two bites of a sandwich. That's how big it was. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. It's one of my... Yes. Is there a time frame on how how often you can do that i mean the cell, it sounds like it's like uh the cells grow big there's no room so you chemo them down they go big yeah so it really depends on the person um adam went home thinking that he was going to be able to do some outpatient chemotherapy and stay home until we got things in order for the transplant to happen but um within three days or four days of being home he was already putting frozen peas on his knees because he was achy and we thought, oh, you know, this is just the course of the disease. Um, but then by day four, was already feeling um, woozy, um, you know, lightheaded, losing his appetite again. And by day five, was already um, experiencing fevers as high as 102 and was back in the hospital by day six getting um, antibiotics and antifungals. Just they worried that perhaps this was, you know, him getting sick, but not cancer related necessarily. Until the following day where he was um, at 103 and in an excruciating pain, and they just said, we need to start induction all over again. So it was nine weeks inpatient, one week home, almost a week home, and then he's been back already for six weeks. Back in the hospital? Yes. What do you, what do you mean by induction chemotherapy? Is okay. that different from other kinds of yeah. chemotherapy? Yeah. Um, so, for example, Adam had done a number of courses of um, a chemotherapy called decidabine which is fairly well tolerated. You keep your hair. That was the question that a lot of people had. You know, if you're having chemo, why do you still have your hair? Oh, because um, that type of chemo doesn't hit the hair. Mm-hmm. And so, um, and I know that that perhaps sounds vain as something that's exciting or, or you know, but you have this 31-year-old virile um, athletic guy who um, all of a sudden loses his hair and that's what made him look sick. Because Mm -hmm. in all that time that he lost the weight, he was still pretty tall. He was still pretty athletically built. But um, him losing his hair was really hard for him because it felt like, now I look sick. Now he feels like a cancer patient. Yes. Yes. And he held on to it for quite a bit of time. You know, I remember having conversations about, you know, let's buzz it. Let's own it. You know, but it's this is um, his decision to make. This is, you know, his that, that was, you know. His choice. And um, I'm glad that we waited as long as we did because, you know, he needed to choose what was good for him and what was right for mm-hmm. him in that moment. So is induction a brand of chemotherapy? It's like so what it is is induction is um, it's basically a marriage of different kinds of chemotherapy. And you can have different forms of um, or, or different groupings of these three drugs. But basically it's these three drugs given to you um, for a few days in a row, uh, a week. And... Um, Induction is a very strong um, course of chemotherapy, so much so that, again, it's, it's inpatient. It's um, something that requires two to three weeks uh, of staying in the hospital post for your numbers to come back up because it r- literally obliterates the system. Is yeah. it only for blood cancers or is it for every You know what? I, other I'm, types mm-hmm. of I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Way to put her on the spot. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I'll no, look into sorry. it. I'll email you. Let me know. Yeah. Um, all right. So it, now, I mean, is is Adam going to be stuck at the hospital until he's cured? 
until his transplant. Um, 99% so, yes. 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 Okay. So at this point, they, you know that, because they already told you earlier, bone marrow transplant would help him. Yes. But that you wouldn't need it for years. Right. And That's what we had sudden, initially thought. Things just turn really quickly from a old old man slow moving tissue cancer to a rapidly developing cancer and a yes. young young guy taking them down. Um, so then the the pressure for bone marrow transplant goes up dramatically. Oh yes. Right? And um, what's that process like? I mean, you need to find somebody who's a match. And what what does that even mean? So a match. A lot of people will say things like, oh, you know, what what blood type is he? And that actually, to a strong degree, doesn't matter because what will happen is before you get transplanted, you get um, a course of what's called conditioning chemotherapy, which is so strong that it wipes out all your bone marrow so that your body can then accept the incoming stem cells. And you then take on the, the blood type of your donor. And so it doesn't really matter what blood type you are. Um, so you could choose the blood types potentially. In, in theory, you can. There was, there, you know, there was certain situations like there was someone who was O positive as a donor, and that makes them not as um, ideal in the sense that you become this universal donor, but it's harder to find matching blood types. Well, right. Yeah, I don't know how much people know about blood types, but I, there's there's a protein that's there's two. There's either the A protein or the B protein that sits on your blood. And if you have A, then you're A. If you have B, then you're B. And if you have both, you're AB. But if you have neither one, you're O. Your body can only accept blood with protein types that you already have. So if you're O, you don't have either A or B. You can give to anybody because they're not going to reject your blood. But if you're AB, then you can take from anybody. You're a universal receiver because right, you have yeah. A, you have B, you have AB, and you have O. They're all compatible with you. So you're saying it's better to take an AB than an O. Apparently so. Yeah. If you have a choice. Right, right. What does make somebody a good uh, match? Um, someone who shares what's called your um, – what happens is you basically get something that's called your HLA typing. And it's sort of like this genetic code, so to speak. It's a series of alleles put together. Um, and that is the best telltale indicator for what makes you a good match for somebody else. And you can have um, – what would be a 10 out of 10 match, which is your you know perfect, perfect. match. Right. In an ideal world, Adam would have had a, um, a matched sibling, a perfectly matched sibling, because that would have been perfect. How many siblings does he have? Adam has a brother and a sister. And they don't, they're not the same. His sister, in fact, the, the transplant coordinator said something to the effect of, your sister and you might as well not be related in terms of oh, your wow. HLA typing. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. And then um, his brother is a half match. Okay. And so there is some, that's sort of like the new school of thought, and there's still some controversy about that. They are doing amazing things with half matches at um, Johns Hopkins, and that may very well be, you know. The future. Yeah, the but future of transplant. Yeah. Right, I and was looking up statistics last night, um, and I think for, for chloride blood, the purse, the, let's say like a, the baby is a 100% match, of course, mm -hmm. um, and then the siblings have a 50% chance of being a match, but the, the opportunity to have a 100% match with their siblings is like 25%. Yeah. So it's still not even Was exactly. there a chance that your kids would have been a match? Um, yes. However, they're too young. To donate. Yes. If we had, you know, this young 19-year-old son, that would have been wonderful. Yeah. But Did no. you test them? You know, no. No. It's probably better not to. Yeah, What's I mean. What's the age for a donation? Um, well, it, the in the United States, it's 18 to 45. Okay. Um, or 44, I believe. But again, um, that sort of varies. Like Canada is something like 17 to 35. Oh. Um, different countries have different requirements. I think there was a girl in the UK, a 16-year-old girl, who just became the youngest um, donor. marrow donor, stem cell donor in the history of the world. Wow. wow. Yeah. Sweet 16. Totally. <laughs> totally. <laughs> what a, I mean, you're 16 years conscientious old somebody's teenager. Library, yeah. Yeah. And maybe so. get a license, too. Yeah, really rad. <laughs> and then have a little party. Um, so for this particular disease, you need to erase all of... Adam's bone marrow yes. because that's what's caused, that's what's overproducing. I mean, he, his genes. How does that work if you give him new bone marrow? So a couple of things have to happen um, right now. Um, 
for example, Adam, we've also discovered that he has a very high antibody count to, to anything A positive blood wise. And so if his future donor um, has, because Adam is currently B positive. Okay. So even though the, you know, the blood um, type doesn't matter that much, Adam would actually have to have these antibodies physically removed from his plasma before the transplant. They just filter them out? Filter them out. Uh-huh. It's amazing what the, it literally sounds like a sci-fi yeah, or movie. Just like like in the middle of it, all the uh, space balls, like a little alien's gonna burst out of his stomach, kind of thing. It's <laughs> yeah. crazy. To me, it just sounds like a, a, an app on your phone. But, you know, right. like, search or on, on like Microsoft Word, search for these and just get rid of them. I'm telling you, it could be a game, right? Like remove all the little Pac-Man. Yeah, for a little <laughs> for like little in science camp. Yeah, <laughs> that would be a great little game. Uh, so. It would be better than if he got somebody who's his own blood type. Um, perhaps, perhaps he wouldn't have to have that done. But again, I'm just looking to have. Step. Yeah, yeah. I'm t- again. If you had lots of choices, totally. And and it hasn't been the case for us, but right. yes. So there is an international registry of uh, of bone marrow yes. donors or registrants, potential donors. Um, do you know how many people worldwide are registered? There's about 24 million people on the worldwide registry and I know that that sounds like this gigantic number. No, not at all. Okay, um, but if you think about it it's less than half of a percent of the world's population. It's n- it's just half of California. Yeah. Yeah. And and there are countries out there, you know, Adam is um I had mentioned HLA typing being a super important indicator of how well you might match up with someone else, but something to take into account is that typically you will match up with someone or you have a higher likelihood of matching up with someone who has a shared heritage with yours. So Adam's parents are Moroccan on both sides. So Adam has a higher likelihood of matching with someone who is Middle Eastern, um, Moroccan, um, than he would w- perhaps with someone living in you know Central, Central Asia. Right. There's such, I really didn't occur to me that there's so few people registered. Yeah. Right, and then she was telling me earlier that 3%, right, yeah. 3% of registrants are minorities. Everyone else is not, and that's why they're having trouble. So that's the thing is that in the United States, the United States has the, the largest registry, and, and Germany actually has the second largest worldwide registry. So if you are Eastern European, Caucasian, um, you're in luck because chances are you have a match. Right. In fact, I remember walking around the hospital around the floor the other day and Adam turns to me and he says, see that guy over there? And I said, yeah. And he says, he has over 100 10 matches. out of 10 matches. Holy cow. Adam had one on the registry um, and she she was a perfect match, a 10, 10 out of 10. 10. And we waited weeks to hear back because she said she had to think about it and ultimately she declined for, you know, whatever reason. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's so... Be like crazy, it's devastating. devastating. Very much so. It was... Sort of imagine whatever's going on in her life though. It's also kind of devastating. For sure. I have never to say yeah. No. Yeah. Which is something I, I want to talk about when we get into how do you register and what's it like to sure. donate. I feel like we should take a quick break and then come right back. <laughs> 